So I'd like to introduce Henry Rodman, Rodman, and I will mute my microphone, and I will also kill my webcam. So let me do that. So the program is all yours, Henry. All right. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, it's really a pretty cool opportunity to be here today. Uh, I'll be presenting some to you some of the results and hopefully uh, an interesting overview of some sort of new methodologies with regards to uh, assessing productivity, specifically in Western Oregon. And I've been doing this work as a master's student at Oregon State University, and I'm in my second year, but I'll just give you a little bit of my background. Um, this is a photo taken this winter out on the, the Great Plains up in North Dakota. And it was actually a kind of a chilly day that day, and um, this was just a kind of a snapshot of you know what I like to do. I'm an outdoorsman and while I study forestry and these days spend a lot of time on the computer, you know, I uh, still dream of going outside some. But uh, anyways, I'm in the second year of my master's program at OSU. I'm studying forest biometrics. I've been working with doctors Doug McGuire and Tamezgan Hylomerium. And uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good program back here at OSU. Uh, I'm presenting to you live from my kitchen table in my home in Corvallis right now. But most days I'm in PV Hall on the OSU campus. I did my bachelor's of science over at the University of Minnesota. And there I studied forest resources with a, you know, kind of a general, it's just a general forestry degree. And that's where I really got tuned into the biometrics side of things. And you know, I wound up working for Doug and Heskin uh, back here. And it's been a really awesome opportunity. So enough about me. I guess I'll. Uh, dive right into the research side of things here. And so here's a quick outline of what I'll be discussing today. And it's, I think, really cool to be speaking to a bunch of you know, people who you know, could actually use some of the things that I've been working on. You know, I spent a lot of time kind of getting these ideas sort of formulated and getting the methods sort of straightened out and hopefully producing something that could be applied out in the real world someday. So, if at any time you have any comments or questions about anything you're seeing, please feel free to hop on the mic, or uh, I guess you can drop a question in through the, the webinar software panel. So feel free at any time to interrupt. This is a, you know, I have a fair amount of flexibility in the time here, so this is a, this should be pretty good. All right, so just the outline. I'll go over some of the some of the objectives that we had when we were kind of coming up with the, the idea for this study. And I'll also go over some of the sort of foundational concepts that I'm sort of leaning on for my, uh, my research. And those relate to forest productivity, how that's defined and what contributes to forest productivity, and how we measure it in the field. And um, a lot of what I'm kind of suggesting and with my results is that we may have some other ways of assessing productivity perhaps using some remote sensing methods and some sort of field assessment of the soil and topography. And so I think that's where it might be really interesting to some of you is in the, the methods of the terrain analysis and the growth analysis. And I'm a bit of a nerd, so it's, uh, I guess, really exciting to me. But um, I think that there may be some tools that you could see applications for in your, in your work as foresters or otherwise. And then I'll sort of discuss, you know, the results that I've uh, that I've come up with, and kind of postulate how they may be useful and how we can apply them outside of the academic realm. Okay, so let's just go into a little bit of a first an overview of my objectives and a review of forest productivity concepts. So the overarching objectives of my study were, first of all to try and piece apart the specific influences of topography and soil on the productivity of Douglas fir plantations. And part of that goal of that objective would result in perhaps developing an operationally feasible method for sampling soils. I don't know about you, but I've spent a fair amount of time by now sampling soils, and it's a lot of work. So it's uh, pretty cool to you know, I, or my, my, one of my goals was to come up with something that could 
be A, useful, and B, practical in the field. And then also, after you doing the field work or you know, some sort of field assessment, using top topography and more kind of analytical or objective methods that we can use, that we can kind of uh, carry out on computers. And I'll talk a lot about that later. So the research questions that we're uh, going after here, it's kind of helped me to have these in the back of my mind at all times, you know, make sure I wasn't getting off on the wrong track. But first of all, are there any topographic or soil characteristics that drive trends in productivity? And you know, there are, it's a complicated question because productivity varies you know, at various different scales. And you know, when I say productivity, I say I'm, I mean the, the volume yield that we see on forested stands. And you know, that's hard to define sometimes because there are many types of volume yield. You know, is it merchantable volume or total volume? Is it just height productivity or basal area productivity? So anyways, that's, uh, you know, this is why it was helpful to have this question kind of back there. And secondary to that question, are there any of these variables that we can observe through a combination of soil sampling and terrain analysis, which you can carry out through GIS software and ever readily available remote sensing information? Okay, so those are the questions I was asking. And a little bit about forest productivity. So the way I see forest productivity is sort of split into two different parts. And some of these things we can control and others we can't. Site quality is you know, often referred to as sort of the golden egg in forest productivity research. It's, been, it's a very nebulous thing. We don't really know how to define it. And second to that, we don't really know how to measure it. But we have some ways of doing that. And I'll talk specifically about those in just a moment. But these different factors that are influencing site quality include climate, topography, soil nutrition, and water availability. They all operate at different scales. With climate operating you know, at a fairly large scale at the landscape level, and topography, soils, and water availability operating at more local levels. And my research was designed to try and tease out the specific influences of the last three bullets on that list, topography, soil nutrition, and water availability. And it's not a, the soil part is particularly difficult to really get a handle on when you're surveying a stand, but that was part of uh, the impetus for this study. And topography has the benefit of being really easy to observe and you know, with the kind of onset of GIS or geographic information systems and the uh, improving computing power, we have a lot of a lot of room to work with uh, topographic information if it tells us something. So that was part of uh, what I was trying to do was figure out exactly what we can learn from these those three things. And I put silviculture up here because this is the part of forest productivity that we have a fair amount of control over. You know, in any given stand, we can design a certain regime, a silvicultural regime, which involves certain site prep methods. We can fertilize or thin and use tree improvement and or genetically improved trees to improve the productivity of a site. And one reason I highlight this is because it's really difficult, even if the sites of two stands are identical, if they have different silviculture, the observed productivity could be quite different. And this presents some challenges in assessing the productivity and subsequently the site quality. So through my study, I tried to isolate just the first section of this uh, kind of schematic here by selecting stands in a relatively homogeneous area and a really local area to isolate effects of climate and hopefully some of these other more uh, silviculturally oriented variables. Okay, so just a, a quick review in case you haven't seen some of these things in a while. Um, these are some sort of foundational concepts uh, for density management and I'd first like to talk about the size density relationship, maximum size density relationship. And in case you haven't seen one of these before, the, the horizontal axis here represents the density of trees in a stand 
And each of these lines up here represents the trajectory of some collection of stands through time across this density and size surface. So on the vertical axis, we have mean tree volume. We often see these with other attributes on the vertical axis, such as quadratic mean diameter or you know, other things. But this is they all kind of tell us the same thing. So I'll just briefly demonstrate what this is doing. So you plant a stand. And first I'll mention that all these lines on here, it looks like sort of a mess, were observations from a uh, set of natural stands. And this is from the publication by Drew and Full Elling in 1979. Really interesting read if you're curious about these things. I have a reference at the end of the slideshow here. But what the goal was was to sort of see that when you when a stand grows through time planted, say at some density, we'll call it 400 trees per acre, it will grow vertically, meaning there are no trees. The number of trees isn't changing at this point. However, when it reaches a certain density, those trees will start to thin themselves out, self-thinning as it's often called. And you'll see movement along this direction. And what the goal of this paper was to show is that there is some maximum, and it's widely recognized in plant ecology, but and this concept has been applied a lot in forestry, but this maximum line we often just sort of assume is fixed for a species. And Douglas Burr we call the maximum size density index of 600 in the coast range of Oregon, for example. And we just do that because it's relatively convenient. Um, as you can see, we look at all these stands. Perhaps they're in different places on sites of different quality, but they don't all hit that line. That line is really just there as a reference to us as the maximum possible for this set of stands that was observed. OK, so enough about that. Um, I have a couple other figures that maybe are a little easier to see. But for example, we have here an unthinned stand, this line on the right. It was planted at some density, or it was just regenerated at some density, and it moves vertically along this line over to the left slightly. When we thin stands, and in this case, we're thinning from below on all these uh, horizontal type lines. We're thinning from below and subsequently reducing the trees per acre and also reducing the density of the stand. And the reason I bring all these things up is because if you have sites of different quality, you're going to see thinning happen at a different level of density or self-thinning. So this control stand appears to be pretty high quality because relative to this 1.0 relative density, it's bumping right up against it. However, we might see in a lower quality stand that control or that unthinned stand move over this way of following that maximum line. So that's, uh, that's sort of what I wanted to say about maximum size density limits. And I didn't have a way of specifically addressing or describing those, but I wanted to just kind of remind you about the, those concepts. So a side index, this is uh, the most common, commonly referred, um, referred to met index of site quality. It has the convenience factor of being reliant on height growth, which is relatively independent of density in most cases. And these uh, curves that I have here are um, from Jim King's site index curves. Uh, he was a warehouser scientist. I'm sure many of you have seen the name or know the, know the site index, but the idea here is that we can judge the quality of a stand by the observed height of the dominant trees after a certain age. And then we index it to 50 years. So the highest quality site index on this graph is 150, and that is 150 feet tall at 50 years old. And what we uh, tend to like about site index is that height growth is highly correlated with volume yield. So sites with a higher site index usually give a higher volume yield at the end of a rotation than sites of a lower site index because the, they're not as tall on a lower site at a given age, say 50 years. But what we have seen, and there's been you know, demonstration of this in a couple uh, 
publications are that or there is tends to be some sort of movement around the volume yields within a given site index, meaning one site index, 150 for example, will have a different yield and volume on one site than it will on the next site. And that's you know, presumably because of differences in the maximum size density limit that I was talking about before, where for a given height, top height, you have different yields of volume. So that's why we're interested in stockability in addition to site index or height growth potential. So stockability is generally just referring to the maximum size density limit for a given stand. And on here I have plotted two lines. If this line represents the maximum on one stand, it's higher quality than the line below it because you can hold lar more larger trees per acre than the lower quality stand. And this is perhaps what's leading to the different yield levels for these different for within a given site index. And you know the principle is documented but we don't really have a way of specifically assigning different yield levels to individual site indices on the landscape in this part of the world. So that's kind of the, the angle that I'm taking looking at um, productivity and trying to piece apart the differences between basal area productivity or horizontal produ productivity and site index or height growth productivity. So that is my review of forest productivity. I, uh, hopefully that uh, refreshed you a little bit. I'm sure you see these things all the time, but that's uh, what I have. So I'll dive into the specific methods for my study. Okay, I did all my field work so all my observations up at the Panther Creek Cooperative Study Area, which is located and uh, nestled into the northwestern Oregon's coast ranges, and it is a pretty heavily studied area. I think it probably has the highest density of, or highest rate of LIDAR coverage of probably anywhere in the world right now. It's been flown with um, LIDAR sensors, I think, probably a half dozen times, dozen times maybe, over the last six years or so. And it made a really good laboratory for uh, my question, which was, can we isolate the effect of topography and soil in assessing differences in productivity? And so here's sort of the criteria that I was working with to accomplish that. Uh, there were a number of, you know, many stands in this study area, and they ranged in age, they ranged in ownership and management, but I tried to select a relatively homogeneous set of these stands to, to assess productivity. And here's just a map of the stands that I wound up selecting. They're uh, kind of, you know, relatively uh, evenly scattered across the study area, but they were, you can see they were different ownership. There was private industrial and BLM. That was those were the two landowners on the types of landowners on which I surveyed um, for this study. And here's just a quick summary of the stands that I surveyed. Um, not too important, but it's there just so in case we have any questions about these stands in particular. Now here are the here's a an example of a plot that I would put in. Um, so my goal was to measure basal area growth at the plot level. And to do that, I measured all the trees, and I was doing my best to create a, a pretty homogeneous data set of Douglas fir stands. So I selected Douglas fir dominated, dominated stands and tried to avoid areas with other types of vegetation, just to make it more simple analytically and uh, teasing out the differences in productivity. But at each plot, I uh, recorded the spatial location and the diameter and a five-year radial increment for each tree. And also I collected a composite soil sample which consisted of a little soil core from each of these labeled points at plot center and then around the periphery. And I threw that in the Ziploc bag and analyzed it later. So in a stand I would throw in all these plots in transects and my goal was to, you know, survey across a gradient in topography and hopefully soils and water availability. 
and I to get water availability or some I perhaps a indicator of water availability I sampled across a gradient in topographic wetness index which is displayed here the redder areas are higher or lower topographic wetness index and blue is higher meaning wetter so I use that just to you know guide my uh, transect locations and the plots were about a chain or a chain and a half apart depending on how steep the slope was and in a couple places I put in grids of plots so relatively high density of plots so uh, I could use that to perhaps do some productivity surface interpolation um, so this is just an example of one stand where I put in three transects and there you go now height estimation you may be wondering what is this green green mass on the left well that's a canopy height surface model and uh, or a canopy height model which is derived from LIDAR and we can use LIDAR for a lot of things including getting a really detailed topographic information but it also tells us something about the structure of the trees and one thing it's really good at is getting the heights of trees and so I used instead of measuring heights because I was mostly in the field by myself I had some help a couple days but to make it go faster so I could get a larger sample I didn't measure heights and I relied on this canopy height model which has some advantages and disadvantages but just a quick overview of how I used it I got the canopy height surface model for each plot and you can see in gray and white down here this is just kind of the the canopy height for each plot that I put in. It's hard to really see the perspective, but each of these little blobs is one plot. And then on a single plot, I could make a, a, an estimate of the height of the tallest trees on that plot by selecting the 95th percentile of all the height values. And this is a you know kind of a, an interesting process. I wasn't sure how it would work, but I validated it against some actual measured trees in the Panther Creek study area and it worked fairly well so that was encouraging and then to get height growth estimation I could do the same exact process for multiple years and this is one nice thing about the Panther Creek data set is that there were several years of these LIDAR height models so it's not not perfect but for uh, you know, what it is I think it's a pretty interesting tool um, using these you know, they're pretty readily available. I'm not, you know, it depends on the state or the ownership, but you can oftentimes get these types of things across a pretty large area. So Panther Creek is special because it has such a um, pretty heavy LIDAR coverage, but it's not alone. Okay. And I also use these heights for my site index estimates, and that'll, uh, I'll discuss that later, but I collected a, or made an estimate of site index for each plot which is sort of a weird thing to do because you know site index is typically assigned to an entire stand but I was interested in you know looking at these really fine scale differences in height growth potential within a given stand or across you know the Panther Creek study area so that's how I use that's how I got heights and I'll move now on to the terrain analysis so terrain analysis is a you know, kind of a an interesting tool. It, it's getting easier and easier as the our computers get faster and the topographic information becomes more widely available. And I used the LIDAR derived digital elevation model or DEM and that's what is pictured here. Um, it gives us really high resolution information about the topography within an area. And I used this suite of software tools to do it, to do my terrain analysis and they're QGIS, Saga, and R, the statistical software package. And you can you can do all these things that I'm talking about using ArcGIS, but I didn't go down that road. And uh, anyways, the principles apply. You can find these tools, or these types of tools, in ArcGIS geoprocessing uh, toolbox, but that's not what I did. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these terrain indices. So elevation, slope, and aspect are fairly self-explanatory. You can 
get a pretty good estimate of that just out in the field you know, with a GPS unit and a compass. And topographic wetness index is a little bit different. Um, and in that it's not something that you could just calculate. And you could probably make an assessment when you're in the field. But using this method, you get a more objective estimate, perhaps. And it didn't turn out that topographic wetness index told me much about productivity, but I still think it's a kind of an interesting tool. Um, it, it, you could pretty much draw a line around the big pockets of hardwoods out in the, across the landscape by just identifying the blue areas on the screen. And uh, so that was kind of interesting. But topographic position index turned out to be more um, useful to me. And topographic position index is a, uh, pretty much can divide up your landscape or assign a, you know, a value to each cell on the landscape, telling you is this cell higher than or lower than most of the cells around it. Ridge tops, you get a high value because you know, it's high. Uh, a cell on a ridge top is higher than probably most of the cells around it, and down in a valley or some sort of drainage, you get low values, and they're represented by the blue on the screen here. And those are um, negative values on the topographic position index scale. So that's just how I went about doing the terrain analysis, and I was able to take all the plots that I put in across Panther Creek and then just basically extract each a, a value for each of the plots from the seat at my desk and uh, you know, so that was a, it's a fairly powerful tool. You can do a lot in a small amount of time if you're uh, interested in you know, attaching this type of information to your stands or your you know, plots that you have out there. So that's how I did that and uh, Measuring productivity was the ultimate goal. So here I have defined you know, the three different productivity variables that I used. First one is basal area of periodic annual increment. And please excuse the metric units. You know, it's convenient at, at, in a lot of times, but uh, I, so I left it in because everything else was still in that scale. And I have, uh, I have axes with you know, English units on them uh, on all the figures. So that should be helpful, but anyways, the point is basal area PAI is the, the growth in basal area per year for each plot. And same with height increment, it's just the growth in height for each plot. And that's sort of a weird, weird thing to measure or estimate, but I tried it. And then site index is the familiar um, index of productivity, which I described in meters, but yeah, same thing. Okay, and I was hoping that any one of these uh, different characteristics, uh, you know, if you were able to account for initial stand conditions, because, you know, all these stands were a little bit different, and they weren't all identical. So if you accounted for the density of the stand and the average size of the trees in the stand and the age, perhaps you could attribute differences in productivity then to one of these topographic variables, say elevation, topographic position index, or some soil textural attribute. And I have up here this uh, weird looking transformation of slope and aspect, which is a really cool thing. Uh, if you're curious about this, I recommend checking out this paper by Al Stage. Um, you know, it's a, he, has, he describes very well the relationship between productivity and aspect and slope. And the reason slope is attached to aspect is because if you have a slope of zero, the aspect doesn't matter, no matter where you are on the landscape. Um, so that term would drop to zero if your slope went to zero. And then the cosine and sine are, allow you to use the, the aspect, which we usually measure in degrees, allow you to you know, make it so that zero degrees and 360 degrees are equal instead of being 360 units apart. But this will all make sense on a, a graph that I show coming up here. So, Grumwell, I have some results. Okay, so what's going on here? This uh, is the result for my analysis of basal area periodic annual increment. And you know, really what I'd like to highlight here, it's kind of a, you know, there's a lot going on on this graph, but you know, the main take home is that 
basal area productivity after we accounted for the initial stand conditions was varying according to the topographic position and the aspect and the slope. So we have up here the highest productivity out of these three predicting or prediction lines. Um, this is the highest, say a ridge top, highest topographic position. And down at the low end, bringing up the rear are the low areas. And this was very surprising to me. Um, I thought it seemed sort of intuitive that sites down lower might have more water availability during the summer drought down there in western Oregon, but according to these results, that doesn't really make a difference. It's uh, something else is driving the trend in productivity with respect to basal area. And then if we look at this middle line, this is where it gets interesting. We have, you know, I have it described down here, it's a mid-slope topographic position, so somewhere on the middle of a slope and has a slope of 60%. So what that suggests here is that at 225 degrees, if we're on a some sort of slope, that is where basal area productivity is maximized. Conversely, if we're down at a northeast northeast facing slope, down over here, it's going to be lowest. And so that's that was sort of an interesting uh, result. And you know specifically why that is, we uh, I can't exactly say, but you know, I could uh, I can make some hypotheses, I suppose. But um, you know, it's it uh, brings up a lot of interesting questions about the allocation of resources on part of these on the part of these trees. You know, when they're responding to say really intense radiation from the sun, or they're being shaded out down in these northeastern slopes. So perhaps it's uh, radiation or solar radiation is beneficial to the trees in terms of basal area growth. So that's kind of kind of the way I've been looking at it. It's hard to to really say what it is, but based on these uh, this analysis, that's that's my my uh, best guess. So just a quick summary of uh, what I found for basal area is that uh, optimal aspect is 225 degrees or southwest facing, and this is keep in mind for a pretty small area in the coast range, but this is a uh, this is what I found. Okay, height increment. I didn't find uh, quite as strong of a relationship, but I have pretty much the same graph uh, as the last one, just with height increment over here. And what I, you know, I'd like to point out first is that topographic position does not really appear to influence the, the, um, the productivity with, with respect to height increment. Over here we can see this is a ridge top and a low area, and they're pretty much the same. You know, there's, it's hard to really show any difference there, but when you get onto a higher slope or a more steep slope, you see this bump, and that uh, you know, says something about perhaps the way the crowns of the trees are interacting when they get on the slope or instead of when they're down in a, in a uh, drainage or on a ridge top. So anyways, these points are just the observations from my data set, and it's really hard to, really hard to learn anything just by looking at those because the stand conditions varied pretty wildly, but using linear regression I was able to kind of make some inference about the specific relationships between things like aspect and topographic position. So don't pay too much attention to, the, to that mess of points up there, but you know the take home is just uh, I'm trying to draw some you know, interpretation about what the regression analysis told me. So for height increment, it wasn't a very strong relationship, but the aspect for optimal for height increment was 150 degrees, roughly southeast facing. And that's interesting because it was different from basal area, periodic annual increment. And you know, why that is, I can't say, but I thought that was a, a rather interesting result. And same with uh, basal area, the amplitude of that effect is higher on a higher slope, meaning the higher the slope is, the more exposed or the more influential the aspect is for the productivity of a given site. And site index, last one. Um, this I thought was a you know, pretty, I thought the most interesting result out of all in, in terms of comparing this with basal area. Um, but what you see here is that low areas, in fact, 
So down in the drainages and you know the bottom of the hill slope tend to be have higher site index than those on ridge tops. And same story as the other ones. The slope of the slope of the um, you know the site you know of the at the plot location in my case it made a big difference. You know made this kind of swing more wildly, and so I think that's pretty interesting. And I'm really curious to hear uh, if you guys have any experience sort of observing these things out in the field, but um, these types of relationships. So, if, you know, perhaps at the end, if anyone has any comments or criticisms, I'd be I'd be really interested to hear that. Okay, so that's a take home here is that the optimal aspect for site index is north facing or northeast facing, maybe, um, and. You know, which is completely the opposite of basal area periodic annual increment. And I have on here a picture of the kind of a map that I made of site index. You know, so if I took, you know, I made a predictive model for site index and made that prediction across my digital elevation model, this is what it would look like with green areas being the most productive. And you can kind of see that it follows this drainage down here. It's sort of hard to get the topographic perspective, but that's what's going on. And I have stand boundaries drawn on here too, just to emphasize that the site index can, not always, but can be pretty different across a stand. So I think that's sort of an interesting question um, when it comes to trying to define productivity for a whole stand. It's not, a, not an easy thing to do because it changes across a stand. But this just sort of illustrates the general trends that we saw and this is a north-facing slope down in a low topographic position right along this band here. And then this is on the other side of the drainage, is south-facing, and there's a little lower side index. And my theory is that the trees down in these lower topographic positions, so down in the drainages, are responding to a light competition. You know, they're pretty light-starved down when they get into the bottom reaches of these streams. And so height growth is a is a, would be highly beneficial to them. You know, if they can get more light than the trees next to them, they'll do better. So that's sort of the way that I'm approaching, uh, you know, in interpreting this result. But yeah. Okay. So just uh, I have a brief discussion to kind of summarize what we've already uh, what I've already covered here, and um, shouldn't take too long. But this is just kind of a uh, description, you know, one picture of how the productivity measures that I used, how they respond to aspect totally differently. And in the solid line, we have basal area periodic annual increment. On this line, we have height increment. And on this line, the small dotted line, we have side index. And this figure just shows how different that optimal aspect, you know, we see this peak in one of these lines as the optimum or the maximum productivity for that attribute. And we see that it's over here southwest facing for basal area, east facing for height increment, and north facing for side index. So that's just a, you know, a visual depiction of that relationship. And yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of you know, interesting questions to ask about that. And you know, my study was primarily just trying to explore to see if we could find some of these trends and perhaps attribute them to uh, specific uh, you know, topographic or soil variables, but I'll talk about that now. So soil, I didn't really get much out of my soil sample. You know, I spent a lot of time in my backyard um, texturing or getting a textural assessment for all my soil samples, and it didn't get me a, get me a whole lot, but I think you know, there's a number of reasons for that. I only took a surface soil sample, and you know, I'm only my soil textural assessments are only as good as my fingers were sensitive to the differences in texture across all my samples. So there are a number of opportunities for human error, but I think that you know, it's got to be at least sort of close to what it was in the field. And what I certainly observed in the field is that soil texture varies a lot in a small area. And I don't think that's news to anybody. That's what people are always griping about when it comes to, you know, trying to use soil variables for these types of things. It's too variable. You can't map it. And, you know, to some extent, that might be true. And but really, what I uh, 
what I found, and you know, I'll latch on to this one positive thing, is that clay content appeared to be negatively correlated with site index, meaning sites on more clayey soils were less productive as measured by site index. And so that's an interesting question about you know, what, what the roots, what's going on in the root systems in these, uh, in these stands. So that's what I found for soil. And you know, I want to admit, I want to be the first one to admit that there are some limitations to you know, the way that my study was put together, but I'd just like to emphasize that it was exploratory in nature, just trying to kind of keep track of some of the you know, gradients and environmental gradients that we have out on the field so that we could perhaps you know, represent these topographic or soil attributes in silviculture or in growth modeling applications. So one issue is that uh, the growth, you know, my estimates of growth in terms of basal area were estimated using radial increment. And that works, but it's not as good as having trees that you've measured over and over again. But I didn't have time to do that in one summer, so I went with radial increment. And I think it should, uh, you know, it's, it is a limitation, but I think uh, it's not insurmountable. And then one, one thing that I had to sort of balance when I was designing the study was how the size of the plot. You know, the smaller the plot was, the fewer trees I would have, but the more sensitive, perhaps, my plot attributes, you know, of topography and soil, they'd be more sensitive to changes in the, you know, in the small area around the plot. So, you know, if I had a larger plot, I would have sort of smoothed out some of the the variability in growth and in site site characteristics. So I I went with a sort of medium, I think, 20th acre. And um, yeah, so the sample that I put in was originally not designed to cover all combinations of slope and aspect, yeah, because I didn't really know the specific relationships between these things. You know, what was going to be driving productivity? I just sort of threw plots out there with my best guess. And it turns out that wasn't right, but I think I still learned something. So that's that's a you know limitation as well. And like I said earlier, remeasured plot data would be ideal, but we don't all have access to that. Um, you know, it'd be cool to an, implement a study where you could where we had that, but um, I didn't have the opportunity this summer. But maybe someday. Okay, just a couple of quick conclusions to sort of summarize my findings and hopefully stimulate some sort of discussion. Um, and I want to encourage anybody to pipe up with their experience or observations in the field or you know, considerations for my analysis. But um, here, uh, what I found is that the primary driving factors um, were topographic in nature. And I didn't learn a lot from the soil sample. And I identified it some reasons for that earlier, but topography appears to be pushing productivity in one direction or another, and that's useful to us because topographic information is the easiest thing for us to get these days. And second to that, top topography can vary a lot within a given stand. So where we draw stand boundaries often is sort of a you know a function of past management or operational considerations. And so they wasn't necessarily designed to really identify homo areas that were the same productivity, which is why I think it would be you know, sort of interesting to consider productivity on a smaller scale than the stand when you're assessing stands. And you know, perhaps the most interesting thing is that height growth as site index and basal area productivity are responding differently to topography across the landscape. And that's an interesting result in itself. You know, there are a lot of, you know, eco ecological questions to ask about that, and um, you know, I can't, I can't really speak to the, you know, specifically what's going on there, but it's piqued my interest. That's for sure. And um, you know, kind of as a follow-up to all of these, is that you know, these local gradients in productivity might be best reflected um, at a finer resolution than just the stand and. So one example of that is a pixel-based inventory. And, you know, that's a you know a whole can of worms right there. It's not you know, pixel-based inventories aren't really who knows if they're better, but they definitely are more useful for this type of analysis where we have really fine-scale observations of topography or soil or other things. So 
that kind of uh, wraps it up. Um, I'd like to thank a couple people. You know, I work for Doug down here at OSU and everyone in the lab there. Uh, it's, you know, it's really helpful to bounce ideas off of them, and you know, I got some help in the field. And then also the Center for Intensive Plant and Forest Silviculture is a research co-op down here at OSU that the Washington DNR participates in. And um, you know, I've had the opportunity to present some of my you know, proposed studies and results to them, and they've provided some meaningful feedback. It's been really helpful. And uh, also to the Washington DNR for uh, allowing me to give this presentation today. It's uh, certainly been an interesting experience, and uh, I think I hope it was at least uh, interesting to the audience today. So thank you very much for your attention. Here are just a couple of references uh, that I discussed earlier, but yeah, thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take any questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, th thank you, Henry, for the um, very, very uh, concise presentation. So there are options for posing questions to Henry. One is to raise your hand, in which case um, I can I can connect your microphone so that you can ask the question uh, with sound, or you can post a question in the question panel. And uh, however you do that, I'll then relay that to Henry, and um, we'll give you a chance to compose your your question. So let me move this over here. So once again, those of you who want SAF credits, if you could either post your um, your member number in the question panel or email me directly with that, that would be great. So I I have uh, I'll I'll salt the question. While we're, while we're waiting for people to do their thing. Um, sure. Since site index is an integration of, of height growth, do you foresee that you might get a different um, response as the age group of stands that you pick uh, got bigger, got older? Yeah, that, you know, that was something I was uh, you know, curious about too. You know, I know when you're using the equations for site index. You know, I was just plugging in a height and an age into the site index equation and getting a site index estimate. Um, I know when you use those, they, they tend to be a little bit more squirrely down in the younger ages. Um, that's just sort of how they work. I don't know, you know, if I were to have a more diverse, you know, set of stands, you know, with different, you know, wider range, it might be interesting to see if there would be, if you get the same type of response, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know. That would be a, you know, I was targeting the specific uh, kind of demographic, I guess, just the kind of middle-aged stands. Um, I had one that was a little younger, but it didn't appear that the side index was higher in that stand. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here. Let's see. Um, let me open. The... Oh, okay. So the question is: Was stocking the same for all topographic positions? If the stocking was less on the ridges, this could be why the larger basal area response. Um, it's a two-part question. Additionally, ridgetop trees tend to have more buttress due to wind exposure, which could be confounding that variable. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. That's that was a uh, you know that that concept took me a while to sort of get you know after I was working this up and it was one of the first questions I got was is you know is there some other trend that I'm not accounting for you know just based on the you know is is the basal area in a given place higher because of where it is and. I think the easiest way to answer that question is in the analysis that I use. I 
built a linear model for um, predicting the, the basal area growth. And in that model, I included the initial basal area as a covariate, meaning if the stand or the plot that you know, had the higher increment had a really high basal area to begin with, you know, it would be sort of ranked against sites of the same initial density. So yeah, I think that's, that's definitely a possibility, but I think that the response that I got should be, or the trends that I kind of unearthed here should be independent of that particular issue. And uh, as for the as for the buttress on the trees, yeah, that's I think that's a cool that's a cool idea, and you know, just in terms of the you know the way growth is allocated on those particular uh, in different topographic positions, you know, on the ridge tops with high winds, or you know, in the lower areas where they're light starved. Yeah, I, that's a that's an interesting um, point. I, I didn't look at, and that's something that's kind of uh, piqued my interest since I was teasing apart the you know the vertical and horizontal growth is that perhaps you know there's some pretty substantial allometric differences you know height diameter relationships with respect to topographic position yeah perhaps a covariate of height diameter ratio or something like that or or yeah. taper um, yeah I have a question from Lauren uh, Lauren Heiner on silviculture applications Lauren I'm going to activate your mic you, could you clarify that a little more Okay, um, so um, so I guess the question the question then is, you know, are, what are the silviculture applications to your findings? Yeah, um, well, I think that the, probably the most direct application would be in thinning. Um, you know, I was going back to the density management diagrams that I showed at the beginning. Um, the, way, the way I was hoping this, to, this would turn out, and you know, there's not a really easy way to, to get estimates of you know, the commonly referred to uh, carrying capacity of a stand. So if I wanted a real silvicultural application, we'd have to have a way of estimating the, or ranking the carrying capacities of stands, and that means, you know, stands with, that can hold more basal area, basically. They would get different, um, they would get different uh, thinning prescriptions, perhaps. You know, you're not, I don't know if it's like a discrete thing, but you might thin more in sites that are going to grow more than you would, you know, down in the lower, lower areas. Or the opposite, you wouldn't thin as much in the, in the more productive areas, because you wouldn't have to. Um, if your goal in thinning is to boost productivity. So, yeah, to answer your question, I, it would be, I would think it's kind of a stretch to apply this in principle, you know, from a silvicultural standpoint, but the idea that I'm trying to get at is sort of ranking sites, you know, with respect to their carrying capacities. And that's, that's a hard thing to do. With, you can't do it with site index. You can't really do it with just one observation of basal area, but um, you might thin stands differently depending on the, the maximum basal area they can hold. I hope that was helpful. Okay. Um, Mike asks, what would you recommend for the next piece of research to follow this work? Ah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I have some ideas for, you know, the best way to try and answer the, you know, answer the question. You know, after having some experience sort of digging around in, in this system, you know, I would, I think the ideal scenario is to find another area, kind of like Panther Creek, you know, perhaps naturally regenerated or a really large tree farm, and put in sample plots and then not thin it and just leave it alone and measure it a bunch for a long time. And I think that would perhaps more readily uh, expose, you know, differences in actual uh, stand uh, carrying capacity. So. I think the next step is to, you know, follow up with a more informed study where we recognize the fact that slope and aspect are driving the biggest trends, and 
and it would be really interesting to look at that across you know a larger a larger area too you know you could you could see if that slope relationship or aspect relationship changes with you know depending on where you are what your latitude is um, yeah so that's that's how I would follow up okay the um, the comment you had on the complexity of soils was brought out at a at a presentation that um, Professor Gannon did for us where he talked about hydropedology and the fact mm. that on, on these steep slopes these soils move and have different um, different soil moisture regimes within them and it yeah. was, your observations really play well with that uh, concept as well. Yeah I was um, the first, I'd say the first, you know, big surprise that I had when I was, you know, out in the field doing the soil sample, and it seemed completely counterintuitive to me, was that at the top of the hill I was getting soils with really fine textures and a lot of clays, and then at the bottom of the hill it was much sandier and kind of coarse textured, and that was, you know, sort of a shock to me. I always sort of assumed that the clays would sort of would get washed down to the bottom of the hill or something like that, but it turns out there's just more water moving through the soils once you get into those lower positions and they become really clay and gravelly or really sandy and gravelly down in those hmm. locations. So there's some kind of interactions between the topographic position and the soil texture itself that you know make it you know it's it's a you know it's a tough system to sort of uh, piece apart. Okay, well that takes us to the end of our hour. I'd like to thank you again for sharing your research with us today and with uh, the foresters on the, on, the, on the program. Once again, those of you that want CFE credits, uh, send me an email. Um, and with that, 